Okay, let's start. I think people will dribble in. Yeah. <laughs> Unless most of the people decided to drop the course, right? You can drop until the last Friday of the 10th week, which is pretty interesting. Um, okay, so firstly, this week uh, on Friday, I would like to do a discussion section. And uh, since after, I think, I think last week was the one where every project got kind of finalized. So the idea is that, uh, recall one of the things I had wanted was to have a pr project proposal plus uh, sort of checkpoint during the quarter. We are going to roll that into one. So on Friday, what I would like to do is each group to just make a very short five minute presentation on what the goal of your project is uh, and where you stand right now. Okay, max three slides. Okay, so um, uh, again, kind of a, uh, uh, what 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 problem you are undertaking? What's kind of the importance and all? Uh, what led you to it? But more importantly, also uh, you know, some discussion on where you what the current status is and uh, any show-stopping things. So. Uh, so, again, uh, if you recall, uh, it's 4 to 5, uh, 4 p.m. to 4.50. So with five minutes and maybe a bit of a Q&A. Uh, it will also help serve the purpose that uh, some of you are doing projects which um, uh, kind of are overlapping. So you would also benefit from that interaction. So those of you trickled in late. So this week on Friday, we are going to have the uh, discussion section. And we will use it for you guys to present um, five minute, three slide max per project uh, uh, on what, uh, again, what the problem that you're doing and where you currently stand. And uh, so just, just that. The other thing is, um, I think there was a group who was looking for uh, Amazon Echo. Were you guys the one? Yeah, okay, I have it. So just collect it from me, please. Um, okay. Uh, so that's those are kind of the main main uh, things. Um, any, any questions? That's it. Okay, and if your project still needs some piece of, I think I think as of now, other than your group with the Wi-Fi thing, I think everyone else should have the hardware that they need for the projects. But if you don't, come and meet me um, so that we can take care of that. Okay. So what um, we are, uh, oh, one other thing. On uh, this Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. in Shannon Room uh, is another computer engineering slash embedded system faculty candidate who's talking about, uh, his talk is kind of across hardware all the way to operating system, but micro power platforms, so ultra low power embedded platforms and uh, PhD student from Berkeley. So again, uh, but consider attending. These are, uh, we, are we are currently seeing uh, lots of faculty candidates kind of uh, roll through both CS uh, and ECE department and it kind of represents cutting edge work which is happening in top universities. So uh, interesting talks. There was one yesterday on um, so machine learning on embedded devices, and uh, this next one is on micropower, and we have two or three others to follow. So today's lecture is going to be on time synchronization. So kind of we built up to it. So previous lectures we have seen clocks, and then last lecture I spent some time discussing um, uh, sort of what, why synchronization is important, what kind of applications it enables and all. Today, the goal is to look at some of the actual systems which are out there, which achieve synchronization uh, and how they work under the hood. And again, uh, it's a field which is continually evolving. So uh, what I'm describing is, uh, again, just a snapshot in time. Um, towards the end, I did talk about that across the applications that we see, uh, it's not like there is a single time synchronization solution which kind of just uh, is good for uh, everything there because they emphasize kind of different dimensions of uh, what is needed. So error, uh, what kind of, uh, over what duration do you need, over what region of space you need, where do you need it, like certain things 
synchronization is much easier outside because you can use GPS than indoors because you don't have GPS signal. Um, um, how efficient you need to be, cost and form factor. So if you're willing to spend um, watts of power, there are a lot more solutions than if you want to be in microwatt, milliwatt kind of range. And we also um, uh, had talked about uh, that um, sort of your limit limiting factors and any synchro uh, so synchronization again is that you now have two clocks and one of them or n clocks and one of uh, some subset of them are your reference so and you want to have the other clocks to reflect their time to within some delta and, uh, and uh, you do it by kind of engaging in some way of exchanging time related information through network packets or some other signals and uh, but you can't do, uh, so how often you do it certainly is going to affect your synchronization if I keep polling the reference continually, then I can always track it. On the other hand, if I can go to it sporadically, then uh, in between I have to rely on uh, the quality of the local clock. So that's the other source of error, and we kind of, again, over the past previous two lectures, have looked at uh, what kind of things come into play. There are temperature-related effects, manufacturing-related effects, and whatnot. Um, uh, then you also have to worry about time of flight. Uh, particularly if um, I don't know the delay but, uh, to the reference clock or if uh, the delay is highly jittery, then uh, uh, it becomes a problem. Uh, part of the challenge out here is that uh, if I were to simply engage in an act of saying, uh, of like send, exchanging timestamp messages, then it's not possible to separate out offset in one's clock with the propagation delay. So like for example, uh, uh, let's say I generate a packet at time t1 according to my clock and you receive the packet and uh, at time t2 according to your clock and let's uh, now we know t2 and t1 then t2 minus t1 is uh, a summation of offset of our clocks as well as the propagation delay that we have so every time you do such a message exchange then you really are getting um, a plus b and to separate it out, you will need to uh, uh, either know the location or you need to, uh, so that you can compute delay or you need to know the clock offset so that you can compute the location. So the two are intimately uh, coupled. So therefore, distance matters. Uh, computational latencies, we are work talking about real systems and even though, so, so in, in theory, what is happening right in, um, Kind of uh, the equations apply between what's happening at the antenna to the other antenna, but in between you have all these layers of software uh, that sits and that adds its own delays. And then finally, time stamping accuracy, and we'll see all of these. So, like, um, it's easier said than done that oh, I'm just time stamping a packet. Okay, pa uh, these packets are not just some particular event; they 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 are um, some. Uh, duration of time as well. So, so what exists now are a uh, variety of different kind of techniques and this was kind of the last slide, last lecture. There is obviously GPS, there is NTP which is the workhorse protocol on the internet, there is IEEE 1588 or as it is called PTP, Precision Time Protocol, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, mostly used for more local area or dedicated links, uh, but financial industry, for example, has become a big customer of this, and as as is, as our setups were, um, like um, physics-related things, like CERN, for example, uses it uh, very heavily. And then, when it comes to the wireless space, there are a whole bunch of boutique, proprietary, bespoke sort of uh, protocols that exist. So let's look at some of these, but. The simplest one uh, uh, is, and this is the slide you have seen before, which is we say that you know our notion of synchronization is simply to get the order right. That is, there are many applications where I don't care about relating the gap between two events to uh, actual uh, sort of physical notion of time. All I care about is this: this event happened first before. A happened before B or uh, vice versa. 
and uh, many applications in uh, distributed computing, databases, security, uh, even sensing, kind of fall into that category. So uh, this slide, if you recall, was that um, all I seek to do is I seek to assign to these events, the red bubbles, a number. And that number that I assign should satisfy uh, the causality property, which is if I'm, assign, uh, if I'm assigning an event a number, uh, then it, that number should be larger than an event which we know caused that event. So in this particular case, we kind of say that, look, at a given node, when events are happening in some sequence, then that sequence is correct. I mean, so that we have to obey. So if uh, E34 happened after E33 uh, on processor 3, then E34's timestamp should be more than E33 timestamp. But additionally, what we also want is that E25 was a message sent, if send event from P2, and E33 is a message send event at processor 3. And therefore, we also want that the number we give to E33 should be more than E23. Uh, so these are, these are both sort of reasonable properties uh, to have. And, but what it also means is that this diagram is kind of a uh, bit, uh, can be a bit misleading if you try to think in terms of, oh, these represent actual passage of time. Because in many cases, you will not be able to say something about uh, whether one is before or after. For example, in this case, E12, so we know E12 is after E24, um, uh, but E25 can be before or after E12. We really don't have any uh, knowledge there. And likewise, E32 could be before or after that. So in terms of this logical clock, you can say that I cannot really order these three events. Again, I can order E33, so we know E33 happened after both E32 and E35, but not, not make a statement about that. And that's fine. So what we are really seeking to do is to implement this happened before relationship, which can come either because events are happening in an order at a node, or because, because of message exchange, I can say uh, sort of um, A cause B. So, um, A happens, uh, so, so if, if you had physical clocks, uh, precise physical clocks, this thing would have been easy, right? I mean, if every node had a precise uh, sort of knowledge of time, precise knowledge of UTC, then our timestamps would have this property, right? I mean, that, that, that we desire. But let's say we don't have that. Let's say we want to achieve this thing purely via uh, some sort of a protocol or a computation strategy. So, uh, uh, so uh, I guess uh, yeah, I've covered most of these points already. Um, uh, the main thing to realize also is that it also follows that if a, a, if we know that A is before B, and by this logic, and if we also know that B is before C, then transitive relationship uh, holds. Okay, A is before C. The other thing is, if I know A is before B and B is before A, then that means they happen simultaneously. That again kind of follows from basic logic. Um, so now how do we go around implementing this? So again, what you're not allowed to have is a real clock, right? I mean, there is no, you can't say, I'll just put GPS, use them to timestamp. I want to achieve this ordering purely, purely in a logical manner. So if you think of a clock at each node to be essentially like a, uh, some sort of a variable which you're going to increment under certain conditions. So, uh, and then whenever an event happens at that node, I'm going to look at that local clock and I'm going to, whatever the clock had the value, I'm going to assign that to the event. So that's kind of what you do with, uh, um, uh, when you do have physical clocks, because if you recall, our approach was we have some sort of an oscillator, it's counting, uh, it's uh, incrementing a counter, and whenever I need to timestamp an event, all I do is I look at that local variable and say that's the timestamp of the event. So the question that we are really seeking is, what is incrementing that counter, right? We no longer have that oscillator with good known frequency, but uh, now we have to figure out when to increment that local clock variable, the variable which is a time variable. So every node has a local clock, uh, so that's C sub i. And if an event happens at node ni, then I just assign it, assign to it uh, the time according to that current local clock. Now, uh, what does the 
block for the whole system looks like. Uh, so the idea would be, can I come up with a function c so that now instead of looking at the local clock, I can refer to that and then assign the event to that number and all these properties should hold true. So that's basically what we are after. Um, and logical clocks are correct if those properties that we discussed previously hold, which is if A happens before B, then C A must be less than C B. So that's, that's what we want. So it turns out that a very simple protocol can help you achieve this. Um, uh, achieve, achieve, uh, achieve this property. So uh, the intuition out here is the following, that every time an event happens at a local node, uh, and it's just a free event, so not sort of message receive or anything like that, then you just increment the clock, right? Because if all I had was non-communicating nodes at a node, events are happening, and I want this property of uh, that C A is less than C B if A happened before B to hold, I can trivially achieve it that every time an event happens, I increment the clock, right? Increment that counter. Uh, but we also have the second property to achieve. Um, uh, so, so, the, so the first case is uh, at the same node, but the second case is that if we are exchanging messages, then if A represents the event at one node of sending the message, and B represents the event uh, corresponding to receiving that message at the other node, then we again want this property to hold. And that you can achieve uh, by intuitively, basically, when you receive a message, then you send, sorry, when you send a message, you send your local clock in it. And when you receive a message, then you, you have the message coming in with a local clock of the sending node, and you also have your own local clock and you need a number which is larger than both of them, right? Because your event is obviously ahead uh, after any of the preceding events at the local node, but it's also after the sending event. So what you do is you uh, increment, uh, sorry, you set your local clock to be maximum of the two. So maximum of your current clock and the timestamp carried in the incoming message, okay? And then you increase your local clock accordingly. So that's what's happening out here, that uh, you send a timestamp in the message, and then when you, uh, so, so when you're sending, you send the timestamp, which is the local clock, and then when you receive it, then you set it to the maximum of the current value of the local clock and the incoming timestamp. And then, again, intuitively, this uh, uh, property would be satisfied. And um, and that's all you need to do. So your local, uh, so now this C, the global function, is basically saying that I'm ensuring that uh, to, to assign a timestamp according to the global clock, all you need to do is you assign, uh, you look at your local clock, which you are incrementing in this particular manner, that every time a local event happens, you just increment it. Every time a message receive event happens, then you set it to the maximum of the current local clock and the incoming message point. And with that, you now have a clock which meets this property that whatever timestamp you will assign at a node to an event is always going to be in the right, right sequence. And then there are going to be ambiguities um, because there was no strict order between some events. So for example, um, if these nodes were to never talk to each other, it's perfectly fine that uh, one node says is January 1st and the other one says is January 31st for all the nodes because we are never talking with each other. So shared notion of time requires communication and every time we have a message exchange, it's helping synchronize the clock, okay? And the other key thing you see out here is that you basically have to carry some time-related information, in this case timestamps, on these messages. If you don't do that, then there is no way to really synchronize. So that's just getting the logical thing right, yeah. So let's say I had two of the embed boards and I wanted to synchronize them. Um, I, if I set both clocks the same, let's just say, how quickly do one, does one clock source tend to drift from the other clock so, source? And like how, how often would I need to make some type of 
Okay, so firstly, remember here we are not cre uh, creating this, but let's say we were saying, look, my strategy instead of this algorithm is going to be that I'm going to boot up these nodes, align their clocks somehow, okay, and then they're free running, yeah. okay? And I'm going to use those free running clocks to timestamp, and after what time am I going to be in trouble? Okay, so firstly, you'll have to make some assumption about how often the events are happening, okay? But let's say you made that. The next thing is how much are they drifting? So anyone recalls what was the part per million of, let's say, a quartz crystal oscillator? Order of something, is it 0.1, 1, 10, 100? Huh? Huh? Say it again? Yeah, so let's say order of 50 to 100 in that range, okay, unless you are compensating and all, okay. So let's, let's say for the sake of argument, 100 ppm. So 100 ppm means 100 parts per million, 100 microsecond per second. A day has how many seconds? 6,400 seconds, right? So therefore, if it is going to, well, I mean, you can now calculate from that, okay? So you get the idea? Okay, so, and then you kind of work it work it out from that. But you'll see that that's pretty lousy, actually. I mean, you, you'll hit many seconds of uh, thing very soon there. So, uh, so you do need this. Now, the thing is the following, that this approach is purely logical. It's getting the ordering right. This is not going to work if those events were, oh, a car entered, car left, how fast was the car traveling? Because if the two events, if they were the only two things that happened, one would have uh, timestamp t and the other will have timestamp t plus one and you can't, cannot really calculate physical variables like velocity with it. But on the other hand, if you are trying to say, did the read, did, was the, was $100 deposited before the $1,000 um, whatever withdrawal took place or after, right? I mean, in a bank, that's all you care about. It's not the elapsed time that matters, it's the um, uh, ordering that matters, in which case th these kind of things can be used. So this is a very simplified version of what happened when uh, in 80s and 90s when the kind of distributed computing folks looked at these logical clocks and all, and I had mentioned this name Leslie Lamport. So this work is, well, I mean, just not this kind of whole body of work around this is what led to uh, him getting the Turing Award, okay? So kind of a lot of intricacies in case, and in all. But uh, in essence, uh, this is an example of what are called as consensus problems. That is, a set of nodes are trying to reach a consensus on that time stamping strategy on their clock. Yeah. Now, uh, so as you can see, this is great, but it doesn't solve all types of time aware problems because we often need to relate our time stamps to the physical notion of time, right? I mean, we have agreed that cesium atom frequencies correspond to a notion of a second, and everything else in physics at some level is dependent upon that. So when you talk about speed and stuff like that, they're all derivatives of that. So in many cases, your computer has to be able to say that, uh, has to have a way of translating these timestamps to that physical notion of time. And so purely logical approaches are not sufficient. So now what do we do? So obviously, somewhere deep down at the top of some hierarchy of clocks, there must be something that we have agreed to represent a second. So remember, uh, I mentioned that for UTC, uh, and there are these bunch of clocks, uh, cesium atomic clocks, which kind of represent, their average represents the humanity's notion of what a second is. And then everything else has to derive from it. That means there has to be a sequence of somehow uh, timing information percolating from them down to your little devices, either in real time or uh, at manufacturing time. Like when a manufacturer sells you a device saying that this is a frequency of a megahertz, that means that they went through the effort of aligning it with what a second is, and then kind of you pray that there isn't much drift in manufacturing error and all, right? But somehow either Manuf through the manufacturing cycle or calibration or runtime protocols, you are referring it back to that physical quantity, uh, otherwise you can't get it. So other synchronization systems obviously seek to do that, and in particular, uh, as we know, between manufacturing and ambient related errors, you can't simply say, I will make a precise clock, 
and then you can free run forever. The, I mean, uh, even even atomic clocks drift and all, and we already saw that for short time scale they are pretty uh, bad. It's only over long time scale they are stable. So therefore, there are a lot of technologies which seek to transfer time, and GPS is one of those. Um, and even though it's called global positioning system, actually probably the better name would have been global positioning and timing system because the two are very intric intricately linked. And the way the system is organized is, and there are others now, China has one, Russia has one, Europe has one, India has one, uh, I think a bunch of them have emerged now, but they basically all kind of roughly operate in the same manner, which is their satellites with atomic clocks. Um, those atomic clocks are kept in sync uh, through things that are kind of, uh, let's say, happen behind the scene. And then you have a node uh, at, of unknown location and unknown time, but it has a good local oscillator, okay? And what you need to do is you need to find out its X, Y, Z, and you need to find out, you need to set the local counter. So in a sense, imagine that the local oscillator here is just implementing a counter, and you are, when we say you're synchronizing, what you're saying is what correction to apply to that counter so that it reflects uh, UTC right there, okay? And um, uh, the, Thing is the following, if let's say we had a synchronized clock out here, let's say my device, this too had an atomic clock and somehow was in sync, then lo locationing would have been easy because all we have to do in locationing is send a signal and measure the time of flight. And uh, now, let's say, uh, let's back up a little bit. Let's say locationing was my only problem. Then one thing I could also do is Satellite sends a signal, this guy bounces it back, the satellite measures the time of uh, the gap between sending and receiving, uh, makes some assumption about uh, reasonable assumption that you are on a given point of sight, divides by two, divides by speed of light, uh, gets the distance, and now each satellite has a distance, they can collaborate, compute the location of this device, and then maybe through the internet send location out there, right? Why why don't we do it that way? Then the timing problem disappears, right? All this guy has to do is to bounce it back. Uh, what's, do you see any problem? Sorry, if I bounce too long. <laughs> yeah, the reverse blink is, so you can't do it with normal little devices, right? So, so that's not a good idea. There's also a scalability issue, right? I mean, if you want this thing to scale to billions of devices, then suddenly the load on the satellites is billions of devices, right? So that's not a good idea either. So it's good if I can make the satellite to be kind of just provide kind of a signal, kind of like the sun, provides light, no need to interact, right? I mean, if we could do that, that's great. So uh, kind of from a design point of view, uh, we satellite can send something, but we shouldn't expect the mobile device to send back something to the satellite or the satellite to process. So then it raises a problem that I can't really measure the distance anymore, uh, right? Because how do I synchronize this thing? Okay, now again, uh, you could say, okay, fine, in some applications, maybe I can have an atomic clock out here, and I, before I go out on my mission, I synchronize it, and then it will work for a while, okay? Not very robust design, and again, um, as I've often said, though, even those chip scale atomic clocks, which didn't exist when GPS was made, but even now they are in thousands of dollars, so not really a sophisticated thing. So the trick then is that we basically formulate it into a one more dimension. So our original goal was X, Y, Z unknown, but what we also don't know is the offset between the time here and the time here, which is, right? So we, but what we do know is the absolute time scale because the satellites are kept in sync. So in effect, you can say the time T, local time T is an unknown. So I have four unknowns. And every measurement, every time you a satellite sends a timestamp message out here, then you are getting uh, a constraint on uh, a joint, some sort of a joint constraint on location and time, right? And oh, by the way, I forgot also, the satellite locations are also known, okay? So these are maintained with size orbital control and all, and periodically corrected and all, so we kind of know that as well. So in a sense, now you have, for each measurement, you have your basic equation is that uh, my location 
minus the satellite location, the distance between the two has to be speed of light multiplied by the my time minus the satellite time plus uh, a delta, which is uh, the offset, unknown offset. And uh, now you have four unknowns, so you need at least four satellites uh, uh, to solve solve this problem. So, uh, so localization alone would have just needed three, but now you need four, and of course, more the merrier, you can kind of, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, other constraints are out here. But so the net effect is that now, if you're successful, then the clock out here is synchronized to the atomic clocks, and it's actually designed to be good enough to send out that PTS signal that I mentioned to you so some lectures ago, that uh, the the GPS boards have a signal, which is basically a, every second there's a pulse, and the position of that pulse is promised to be greater than 50 nanoseconds, effectively order of 10 nanoseconds, let's say, okay? Uh, but your vanilla GPS devices and of course your phones and all, while they have GPS, they don't do that, but they do have access to that signal. So internally, presumably your phones are, can make use of it uh, to, uh, so that's the basic uh, GPS uh, concept and pros, uh, pretty reliable. These satellites are uh, obviously a critical infrastructure, so they are maintained carefully. Um, cannot work indoors, that's a con, uh, foliage, under tree, those kind of uh, problems. Um, expensive, I mean, um, uh, standalone GPS by the time it's packaged and has a little computer and screen and all, it's reasonably uh, pricey device. And even if you're embedding a GPS chip on your computer, on your embedded system, uh, again, these are not exactly cheap chips, okay? Um, there are other issues also out here. So uh, I mentioned previously GPS takes time to sync to the satellites. Oftentimes satellites are not visible. For example, if you are in the alleyway between Volta and E4, um, you can typically not see more than a couple of satellites, okay? So, or you have to wait for a lot, you have to be lucky. So all, uh, all those kind of uh, things come into play. If you totally power down the satellite, then when it comes up, it has to hunt for the satellites in the entire sky. And of course, it doesn't know that, oh, there are buildings and stuff like that. Um, so uh, on the other hand, if it's a hot start, that is, it had some previous time locked onto the satellites, then it can remember those things and then kind of go and uh, uh, sort of narrow the search, uh, so to say. Uh, you can also have, uh, if you have connected inter, uh, GPS devices, that is they are connected to the internet somehow or other, then based upon some rough location, like if we roughly knew that we are in LA, then uh, maybe AT&T or some server on the internet can guide your device saying that, you know, look in this direction of the sky, okay? So it can help narrow th uh, things down also. So anything which can speed that up uh, can, uh, Helps. There are also ways to improve the accuracy. So, yeah, also. So, if uh, uh, there, there is always some noise in this process, okay? Uh, some of it is natural. So, like for example, an assumption we make is the speed of light, uh, but that's the speed of light through vacuum. But the radio signal is traversing through layers of atmosphere, and the current atmospheric characteristics are going to affect the precise speed of light through that medium, okay? And therefore, there is an inevitable perturbation there. Then you have errors because of the geometry of the system. Imagine the satellites you are seeing are all very close to each other. Then the rays from them are reaching you almost parallel, and therefore, you're numerically, you are in kind of a bad situation. So a tiny little measurement error in range can translate into a large error in location and time. And so it's called geometric dilution of precision. And so those kind of problems come into place. So to compensate for it, what is typically done is something called differential GPS. And the idea is that we have fixed receivers, receivers in fixed location. And after a while, the noise average is out, so we know their precise GPS location. And now, what happens is, the uh, kind of the idea is that if I'm seeing an error, then a nearby reference receiver will also see the same error, right? They're kind of geographically co-located. 
and therefore it can send me the correction factor which I can apply because it knows its true location. So it works in the reverse, it estimates kind of estimates the ranges uh, and it knows its true location so it finds out how much noise is, must be getting added, it broadcasts it, okay, so again over a network and then you make use of that to get more precision. With that you can get higher precision location and higher precision uh, timing. So, um, so that's how GPS receivers um, uh, sort of do. There are a lot. You have a question? Yeah. Yeah, it's a few small things. So mm -hmm. one would be if you're talking about where it needs to look in the sky, how does, I mean, it's not, for something like your phone, it's not a big dish to even. Oh, I. So how does it mean? How does it know where? <laughs> okay, I guess you're looking at the. Uh, uh, that's an interesting thing. So I guess uh, uh, I've never thought about it. So uh, what happens in that process, right? I mean, it is, uh, I guess the thing is there would probably still be an initial hunt for a satellite or something and once you have that, then you can begin to focus it. Yeah, I don't know, that's a good question. Never thought about it, yeah. Isn't it inherently designed to be sort of like there's no direction to the network until you want to know how the device is oriented? Yeah. So at one point there'll be one quadrant, or one octant on the uh, on the axis. So yeah, as soon as it's I mean, it's kind of like up in the middle of nowhere, and uh, like which direction is left or right? I have no idea. There's no coordinate system to work with. Yeah, never thought about it. Any other question? Okay. Yeah. Also, so on the note of it being energy hungry so just at a high level it seems like it's just listening so why is it why is so it energy about? hungry right That's because the, because the processing that goes on to find the location is pretty insane okay. so it's not I mean it comes across as oh I'm just in doing some simple geometry but it's actually um, um, the algorithms are a lot lot more complicated yeah, than the whole. Uh, yeah to the to the extent that oftentimes these things make use of custom chips and all to do it okay so okay. that's basically yeah basically the issue out there um, there are entire books describing the algorithm okay so uh, so 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 this mental picture that like oh I'm just minimizing root mean square error or something like that is a very very simplified description of what is happening yeah uh, there are specialized GPSs which are designed for very rapid uh, uh, working in a very rapid situation also but they make use of uh, um, so um, uh, we kind of encountered it in recent years in, in some of our projects so marine scientists often tag animals with GPS and what happens is that these animals are most of the time underwater so GPS is not working and they come briefly to the surface but too little for a GPS to kind of hunt around and all at that time okay so but still seeing some satellite signals right so what the, um, what um, and and the other thing is that they don't want very power hungry things similarly um, biologists who tag birds and all face an issue which you want to keep the GPS processing very simple so there are these GPSs, what they do is they just log the raw sensor, uh, raw, G, uh, raw satellite data. And then uh, post facto, after the device is retrieved, then it is processed together with other information about where the satellites and all were. And it turns out that this way, even tiny segments of signals can be exploited because what two things are happening. A, you can bring heavier duty algorithms, but the other is you can fuse it with other information that is available Okay, so kind of combine that. So, so there are there are companies, there are a few companies, uh, one or two companies who really specialize in kind of that that part of uh, the GPS space. The other thing is um, uh, bad things do happen to GPSs also. So uh, um, there was an episode late uh, in 2016. Okay, where um, the Air Force, which manages the GPS satellites, was doing some software update. And it took some of the uh, some of the there was some bug in it. Okay, loosely speaking, so some swath of the Earth, which included UK and parts of Europe, 
uh, saw uh, error in the GPS time of around 12 microsecond, 13 microsecond, something like that, something pretty tiny. But it brought down radio stations and communication systems and all because they are all, all, all cellular base stations make use of GPS for example, okay. So, so that was um, uh, something uh, that, that when things go bad. And the final one is GPS is attacked also, sometimes deliberately, uh, so that um, for, I guess, safety reasons or authoritarian reasons, and then sometimes it is just being hacked. So you can buy devices now which can spoof uh, GPS satellites and cause a different sense of location. Some years ago, there was an episode where a drone in Afghanistan was landed in Iran and Iran captured it and there was a lot of media splash over it. And, and the thesis that sort of I saw in the technical community was that what happened was that um, GPS is designed for uh, in a military mode and in a civilian mode. So in the military mode, there is some additional information satellites send and they are encrypted. And that basically served to enhance the accuracy of the underlying optimization problem. But what, uh, so that encrypted mode cannot be spoofed, it's digitally signed and stuff like that. But if you can, uh, but on the civilian mode, you can fake a satellite, okay, and then feed a signal which, uh, even trivial stuff like, I will uh, receive the satellite signal and I'll jam your receiver. And so that you are not listening to it, I'm listening to it, and then I'll just capture it, and then replay it after a little bit. Okay, so what have I done now? I have delayed the signal, right? And once you delay the signal, the receiver would think that you are the satellite is farther away, and therefore we can manipulate the location of uh, the receiver or manipulate the sense of time. So I have read that if you are in red square. Moscow, then your GPS reports a position which is nearer the airport. So I think they deliberately um, sort of spoof the satellites to kind of fool you, fool your receivers. Um, I was also at a conference, I was reading that um, these attacks have become so prevalent that um, any almost any place in this country you'll see spurious GPS signals and all kind of present. One of the reasons they are also being attacked is that some of our critical infrastructure, cellular I always al already mentioned, uh, electric grid also depends upon the GPS timing, okay. Uh, so anything you can do to subvert the notion of time will, can, can, can cause those things. So those are, so GPS is relatively unprotected. It was kind of designed in an era where um, I guess the sophistication of attacks wasn't Appreciated and yeah. Now the flip side is that now you have several systems that you can make use of and the latest chips simultaneously support the Chinese system, the Russian system, the European system, the American system. So you have kind of multiple uh, options available and so just robustness from diversity that comes into play. Okay, so that's GPS and again like I said good enough to get you to uh, nanosecond level uh, accuracy, but you can't really use it as your primary clock because they're still coming one second apart, so a lot of things can happen in sort of one second. Um, okay, so another source of time is operated by NIST, National Institutes of Standards and Technology. something, technology? Okay, yeah. And these are the people who are actually responsible for maintaining all the standards or standard time, standard weight, standard blah, 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 okay. So lots of work that they do in this space and in particular one of the service they provide is out of Colorado, which is they continuously broadcast time and frequency signal from the official standard at, a uh, at, at, at several radio frequencies, several radio stations, okay. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, and it's pretty high power so that it covers kind of continental scale uh, land mass. So uh, the signal is transmitted with a carrier frequency which is tied to the, eventually to those season clocks. Uh, and then modulated on top of it is the 
is a repeating time information. So it's basically saying time is this, time is this. It's kind of again, there's some kind of a something special at the second boundary. So it's basically binary coded decimal timing, uh, time information at a pretty low rate. Okay, so uh, I mean this is this is intended to kind of give you snapshot. Right? Time is this now. So you can think of it like a little bit like a PPS signal, except that it is digitally embedded into. Uh, there's a bit stream, and you know that a particular marked point in the bit stream indicates the time, and that happens. Okay. If you can remove the path delay by averaging, then it results in uncertainty, which is better than 100 microsecond. Okay, not as good as GPS, so that's like three to four order of magnitude better, um, but uh, uh, but it, uh, it 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 gets you uncertainty uh, in, in in that level. But you still have the absolute delay part to worry about, right? I mean, if I'm saying time is whatever t, but if the signal delay is there, so uh, what do you think is the speed of light delay across the nation, roughly? Um, like one, one no, 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 that's too much. <laughs> it's around twenty milliseconds. Okay, so uh, yeah, so it's in tens of milliseconds, twenty milliseconds or so. Okay, East Coast, West Coast. Okay. Hawaii will add another 20, 30 milliseconds. Okay, uh, so uh, so that delay is there. It's also available via a variety of other things, and unfortunately, the satellite, uh, the slide is a little bit obsolete because the Trump government is the uh, Trump administration is shutting down some of these sources apparently because of money saving. I think you could argue that uh, this was established in an era where time information was not as readily available, but now there are so many alternative means to get the time information that uh, maybe the time has indeed come, okay? I mean, not every decision is necessarily politically motivated. I think in this case, it's simply uh, that uh, for most purposes, this information is not very uh, important because you can use the GPS, you have wide, easy access to time servers. Unfortunately, one corner of industry does use it. So when you hear these atomic accuracy wall clocks or nightstand things and all, they are all basically making use of it. They have little receivers, um, and uh, 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 they basically derive time. So whenever they shut, they are shut down. These clocks will be operating freely. So that could be fun. Uh, the carrier frequency out here, if you notice, if any of you are into ham and all, I mean, this is a short wave frequency. So short wave radios are, uh, again, this is before internet became the information thing, it used, that's how the world talked, right? Long distance communication, these things kind of bounce off the upper layers of the atmosphere and travel long distances, so Voice of America and BBC and all, this is how kind of they would have a worldwide audience. Um, uh, what you do see is that the propagation is affected quite a bit by uh, atmospheric condition. So for example, at two different times, uh, you see the coverage here versus the coverage here. So in good, under good settings, the coverage goes all the way to parts of South America and even Western Africa, and then other times it's Sort of not even covering the entire continental US. So highly variable, uh, but still an interesting technology. Ni nice thing out here is that your receiver can be dirt cheap, a simple analog circuit, you can pick it up, okay? So you don't need any fancy processing and all, and you are getting time directly, right? I mean, uh, as opposed to uh, the GPS where uh, you have to compute time, so a lot more computing going on. The other thing is because the carrier frequencies and all that are being used, they kind of, uh, um, get inside the homes and also you don't have to be outside you can receive these signals in you know, even underground and also those are nice things so why not put a WWVB receiver at every node well besides the point that soon the service will disappear uh, it has outages um, uh, also uh, so during those times you're uh, you are in a free running mode uh, outages in part because of atmospheric conditions. Um, also, uh, uh, what happens is now that uh, 
all that, so, so these receivers are designed to be pretty simple, right? So what they do is they, whenever they get the WWE signal, and, and it tells them time is whatever this, they basically switch to that, okay? So you see jumping effects. So if a receiver is connecting to this thing infrequently, sometimes the clock may go back a little bit, okay? Um, so, uh, the, so even with the so-called atomic accuracy and all, they're still kind of fraction of a second type accuracy or not um, because the cumulative effects. And then finally, uh, you can't really use it again as your primary clock in the sense that, again, you should use it to discipline a local clock as opposed to using the primary clock. Now, these cheap wall clocks and all use it that way, um, uh, but it does come at the cost of energy. Okay, so, uh, so that's the radio signal. Again, it, in, in effect, it provides you timing information out there for you to just sub. Okay. Next one. So this is something that I had asked at the end of the last lecture, if you recall, what sources of timing information are out there? And I think one of you had answered the AC signal, and that is indeed the case. Um, uh, so normally, the 60 hertz AC signal is a nuisance. If you design poor circuits, you'll see a near oscilloscope signal, kind of that under, underlying noise out there. But what if you could extract it? Now it turns out that uh, for the stability of the grid, keeping that frequency uh, stable is very important. Intuitively what happens is when the load increases, then the frequency, because it's supplying, it has to supply more energy, uh, then uh, uh, then the generators have to uh, sort of compensate for it and the frequency uh, begins to droop. And likewise, if the load is too little and there is excess energy being generated, then the frequency will start going up. So there is constant regulation going on and uh, to keep the supply and the uh, load kind of matched. So the main point being that this frequency is kept fairly stable, okay. Uh, you'll see jitters and all, but thing is a long term, good long term stability. And if, uh, and if you don't have it, like I said, bad things happen, so like blackouts happen and all, okay, massive scale. So, uh, so what you could do using this thing is you can create a sort of a stable source of frequency, right? And uh, syntonister refers to things which synchronize frequency uh, as opposed to synchronize time, okay? Uh, and basically, again, some simple circuit with a little microcontroller and some kind of smoothing and all, you can uh, create these things. So this was some work out of CMU where they showed that um, they could, with micro watt level power consumption, essentially a decade on AA, uh, you can get uh, stable enough clock which would basically give you better than millisecond change in a 10 to 11 day period. Now, these guys were doing it for a very interesting thing, coal mines. So this is Pennsylvania, okay, and bordering West Virginia. So coal industry is a huge thing out there. And uh, so there are a lot of projects that CMU does, which is really about things inside coal mines. And this was one of those, which is how do you maintain, like if you're sensing and all out there, how do you get good timing information there? And since AC power supply is sent out there from sort of from the surface, so if you can pick that up, uh, it's a good source of uh, clock. So, uh, so that's the AC signal. I'd also mentioned NTSC signal last time around. So, I um, <coughs> off the uh, uh, off the top of my head, I don't think there's a paper I have that I've seen this, but it's an obvious one which is kind of out there. Um, uh, cellular carriers they also transmit timing signal, so that's obviously another one, but the circuit to extract it is going to be a bit trickier. A2.11, uh, they also use, uh, they also provide synchronization signals because uh, power management and all for Wi-Fi devices in part relies on the receiver being in sync with, uh, with, with, the, with the transmitter. So you can think of it as kind of a local area version of what the NIST thing was doing. It's conceptually the same idea. You're not, in all of these things, what's happening is that you're transmitting time information just one way. Okay, so GPS, remember in GPS what was happening was you were not just transmitting time information. GPS satellite is not simply time is this. 
it is telling you, uh, I'm sending you a message from satellite K, whose location you know, and uh, it's sending it at this time. And multiple satellites are doing it. So GPS is doing something very different than what uh, these other systems are doing, which is they are either giving you a frequency signal, like the AC signal or the NTSC signal, or they are t sending you a signal saying, time is this, and then I don't care about the propagation delay. That will be an inevitable thing that you are going to face. Um, so in 8.11, um, since your typical access point is maybe, let's say, 50 meter away, uh, so you can work out, but you are going to be in uh, pretty reasonably accurate territory uh, in terms of time, despite the delay that is coming kind of from the base station. Now, the needs of Wi-Fi are much more modest. I mean, remember the packets and all there are being sent at rates and all that they probably only need, I don't know, tens of microsecond level synchronization or perhaps single digit microsecond. So uh, so that relatively speaking, the delays that they see are relatively puny. So but that so all that happens in this is that there is a packet once in a while that the Wi-Fi access point sends out saying this is a time. And then all the clients do is, is copy it. OK, so they look at the field. They say, what's the timestamp there? What's the timestamp in my local clock? Let's correct it. And that's sufficient for the purposes that they are after. Um, millisecond type accuracy. And again, you are ignoring the one-way delay and all. OK. So if this level of accuracy is sufficient for you, then all these solutions are fine, right? I mean, uh, you basically one-way transfer of time, in that I encode what the time is, and uh, every time I send you a packet, uh, you can uh, copy uh, the timestamp and adjust your clock. Now, that's not a very good thing to do, because your local time may, as a result, see move backwards and stuff like that. So you could resort to smarter techniques where, for example, instead of immediately responding to what the timestamp is coming uh, and, and saying what you could do is you could begin to look at the pattern that you are receiving, like the timestamps, and then try to fit some curve to it. And then you can predict some how your clock is drifting relative to the base station clock. right? Because if I can estimate the gradient there, then I know the drift of my clock. And you can use this thing beneficially for a couple of different ways. So one is, let's say you suddenly receive a packet and it shows that the time has, that you have moved too far ahead. Then instead of correcting in one go, you slow down your clock. OK, so you basically uh, start to advance the counter more slowly so that eventually you meet, as opposed to immediate correction. Both parties are moving forward, but you sort of seek to to meet. Uh, so, so that's one thing you can do so that your clock is monotonic, your, or your local software will see a monotonically increasing time. So that's one um, yeah, benefit. The other thing is you can use it for power management purposes. If it turns out that you find that your clock is super stable, then there is no need to listen to every beacon. You can maybe listen to every alternate beacon or every tenth beacon, right? So you can save, uh, you can increase the time between when you want to act upon it. So that's the other benefit you can do. So uh, now, 82.11 clients don't do it because they're typically laptops and also all this stuff is of only little interest to them. But if you're on a more resource-constrained uh, wireless protocol, then all those kind of things become, become candidates. OK. So this was one-way time transfer. But one-way time transfer, as we saw, suffers from uh, uh, not always suffering from like that unknowable delay that exists, right? So the only way to get around that is to have a two-way time tra uh, transfer of time, kind of a bi-directional handshake. That's one thing. The other thing is that what about things which are not on, uh, let's say, these dedicated things like uh, radio link where, where the delay characteristics are pretty good. What if you are on? the internet and all with the delay characteristics are not that great. So then you kind of get into a different suite of protocols. And um, uh, the one which is most widely used is called NTP, 
plainly stands for network time protocol. Uh, it came out of and is maintained by a professor called David Mills at University of Delaware and he's like the king of NTP. So kind of a huge operation uh, around this work, lots of books and papers and stuff like that. Uh, it's a pretty old protocol and gradually over time lots of vulnerabilities have been discovered from a security perspective. So again it was designed in an era where um, hackers were uh, considered to be good. So kind of lots of things are uh, left unprotected. Basic idea in NTP is that there is a set of time servers which are kind of what are uh, called uh, sort of the tier one or stratum one as it's called, okay? And then there's a whole hierarchy. So like ev at every tier, the kind of one tier interacts with the tier above, okay? So uh, you have level two, level three, and then finally kind of your uh, regular devices like your phones and laptops and stuff like that. And at, an, at any given layer, what happens is that you can set your um, node to uh, reach out to one or more time servers and uh, interact in a protocol exchange with them. And the protocol exchange, I'm going to jump a few slides to show the basic computation, actually jumping many slides uh, to show the basic computation that happens. Let's see. It, yeah, okay. So this is kind of the heart of what NTP, you know, kind of this bi-directional exchange that happens. So essentially one node is sending a message at a certain time according to its clock. So the subscript here says this time is referring to the clock at a particular node. So node A sends the packet at time T1A, time stamps it, uh, okay, and node B receives it, time stamps it, but T2 is according to B's clock. Then B sends back the packet, you know, carrying T2 and carrying T2 in it, and this time stamps at, at T3, and so the packet here also carries T3 in it. Somehow we are able to time stamp and include the time stamp of the packet, and then finally it's received here, so T4. So I have four times, T1, T2, T3, T4. Two of them are with reference to A's clock, two of them are with reference to B's clock. And now if you think about it, T2B is going to be T1A plus the delay between A and B plus the offset between A and B. And this is what I was referring earlier, that delay plus offset are always uh, come together. So from just this measurement alone, I cannot estimate the offset. Well, I can if I know the delay. And I can get the delay if I, let's say I was on wireless and I characterized everything and I knew the distance. If I knew all of that, then delay A to B is known and then a single measurement can give me the clock offset. Okay, but generally speaking, I don't know that. And particularly in the NTP setting, I'm going over the internet through kind of many, many hops, so I don't have any notion of a knowable delay. Um, the other thing you will notice is that delay A to B and delay B to A need not be the same. In a wireless link, that's quite probably true. Um, I mean, you know, there's no reason for the delays to be any different, but um, internet and all that's not the case, uh, mostly because we receive, we, we use a variety of different uh, technologies. Even for wireless, if you're looking at things like cellular, the delays are very different. Like for example, the delay in uplink is a lot less than, sorry, is a lot more than the delay in the downlink. Or likewise, in your cable uh, modems, the delay in the uplink is a lot more than delay in the downlink. Anyone knows why? What's special about uplink in these things? Uplink is the cat your your actual device actually talks to the transmitter. Sure, yeah, but then downlink, that device has to talk to me, right? I mean, so that alone doesn't explain it. Mm -hmm. Well, what? Even? So in uplink, you are competing to grab the channel also, yeah. right? I mean, so there's a queuing delay, yeah. okay? So that complicates things. So you would see a high degree of delay asymmetry uh, in the uplink, which is why like if you, when you purchase ADSL or cable modem or uh, thing, the services are always like 
a gigabit downlink and like 20 megabit uplink, right? I mean, they're highly asymmetric. Uh, but those are the bandwidth numbers, but the delay numbers are kind of, in, are, are similar. You will see the delay. So, so this is a, so, so the only way I can, so if you look at these things, this, these equations have four, uh, sorry, three unknowns, delay A to B, delay B to A, and offset A to B, but I have two equations. And every time I take one more measurement, I get one more equation, but I get one more variable, right? The new delay. So I can't really, you have to make some assumption someplace to kind of make, make this thing work out. Common assumption is delay B to A is the same thing as delay A to B, and then I can kind of solve this. Or I have to say, I know delay A to B through some prior characterization and calibration, which may be possible in some cases. Then I can kind of do this. Uh, the other thing to notice is that if I do multiple measurements of, from A to B, back to back, so let's say every, I send out A sends to B, then A again sends to B, I keep sending a packet train. Mm -hmm. And let's say delay A to B is constant, right? Mm -hmm. So then, between two equations, I will begin to get how offset A to B is changing. And what is change in offset? What is B over ZP of offset? The drift, right? I mean, so it basically tells you how your clock is changing. So essentially, you can think of this message thing as kind of like a probe. It's a sensor. It's letting you make a noisy measurement of uh, clock and delay, right? I mean, it's telling you some, something, something like that, and then what you have at your hand is an inference problem, right? I mean, it's essentially a sensing problem. Bunch of measurements and I need to derive variable of interest, okay? And the newest techniques have begun to bring neural networks and machine learning and all those kind of methods also onto this. Okay, so going back to NTP. Uh, so uh, while conceptually that's a very simple thing, but you can see now, Clocks are drifting and stuff like that. So the under the hood uh, algorithm actually is pretty complicated. There are phase lock loops and Kalman filters and stuff like that. So what I made it sound like just this simple kind of bi-directional ex exchange is actually a pretty reasonable, reasonably complicated uh, system under the hood. Uh, now the nice thing is that people have created open source software and all for it. So you have both. NTP daemons so that you can run your own local NTP server, let's say at your home, uh, which will mm, synchronize and then your clients can synchronize to your local server. So and so the client stuff is also all available. Uh, uh, the level one nodes out there are synchronized to UTC through GPS typically. They may have some other sort of uh, nice, nice good clock. Uh, usually, you don't just talk to one time server, you may talk to multiple time servers and then average them or do median filtering or something like that, so that just in case one server is behaving maliciously or uh, perhaps is just wacky, then you kind of rule it out. Uh, so all those kind of things sort of come into play and the net effect is that NTP can give you tens of millisecond type accuracies and uh, sorry, maybe let's say order of 50 to 100 millisecond accuracy for wider area and on the local area, like if you're running on Ethernet on a LAN, maybe even a millisecond, okay, uh, or a few milliseconds. So it can be pretty good. Um, uh, there is another standard which also exists for time synchronization and it's relevant because of our phones and it's called NITZ, N I T Z, okay? I don't know what it stands for, AkashNet. You guys are supposedly working on that, no idea? Okay, so NITC is uh, part of the so-called GSM standard, which was what T-Mobile and AT&T use. So their base stations provide, uh, again, a similar handshake thing so that your phone can learn the time. So your phones are usually capable of doing both NITC and NTP. Uh, just as an aside, a couple of my students are doing some work characterizing um, how good time synchronization is on our mobile phones because we noticed some interesting anomalies. So the upshot of all of 
this is, what they have found is, and this is across, let's say, order of 15 to 20 devices, is that iPhones are really great, okay? Uh, they maintain their time to milliseconds, okay? Yeah, just, okay? Android phones are pretty lousy to errors approaching good tenth of a second in some cases and huge spikes as in suddenly you would see like uh, so, so the experiment that they have done and maybe next time I'll remember to bring the plot is the following periodically they have a sound signal going out okay and they have software running on these phones all these phones which time stamps that sound signal okay and then they're looking at the time series of time uh, timestamp so on the iPhones, you just see kind of very solid and uh, very little uh, difference. And on the Android phones, you see these peaks and all coming, huge drifts and all. And even in terms of absolute time, so there are some apps like if you, depending upon whatever phone you have, um, iPhone, and if you just go to the Play Store or App Store and you type NTP, you'll find some apps with basically in the application space, contact the NTP servers and show you what time it is getting. And you see consistently that the iPhones are at, like, like I said, sub 10 millisecond type accuracies, and the Android phones are uh, just all over the map. So I don't know what the reason is. Um, it, that's what sort of those students are trying to figure out. Uh, this seems like an interesting thing and such a huge uh, uh, variation. Some of it, uh, could also be scheduling, uh, the, operating, the process scheduling that the operating system is doing. But um, we have also, sort of as we have dug, it also seems some of it may also have to do with that Android phones use Nitzi and uh, use NTP only uh, as a backup, whereas Apple may be doing something different. So, but anyway, interesting observation. So if you are trying to do anything where multiple phones have to coordinate to do something like synchronized images, for example. You know, you have seen those things where people try to take images of a bullet being fired or stuff like that, right? Multiple synchronized cameras. Don't do it with Android. Uh, it's quite, 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 quite off. Okay, uh, I mentioned that NTP uh, software is widely available. So there are two kinds of software. There's the NTP daemon which is kind of the background software which is running and essentially acts as an NTP server and in turn syncs with the next level of NTP server. And um, uh, these, th this, is, this, is, this is available for um, you know, all major operating systems. Um, so, but uh, I guess as usual sort of, if you want to have fun with it, run it on Linux. Um, um, and what these NTP daemons are capable of doing is kind of two things. So either you can attach a GPS to your computer with the one PPS signal, and then it will discipline the clock of your computer to the GPS. And then your computer basically becomes a time server, or, or uh, primary time server, right? So just getting it to GPS. Or alternatively, you can set this daemon so that it talks to another NTP server and then locally on your local network acts as a server. In this case, it's a next tier of an NTP server. Um, the second piece of so software is obviously the NTP client, right, which talks to this thing. It doesn't have to uh, provide timing service, it's purely. Now, it turns out that on many devices, uh, like your phones, unfortunately, they do not give you access to the NTP client. So if you are on Linux, you can manipulate the NTP client, and if you're running an NTP daemon uh, very nicely, there are lots of commands available. You can change the pa uh, parameters and stuff like that. There is a, in Linux machines, there is a NTP configuration file where you can go and tell it how often it should synchronize, all those kind of things. But when you are on phones, so whether it be iOS or Android, all of that stuff is hidden from you. All you have is, uh, what's the time? And the OS tells you what the time is. And unfortunately, as I said, on iOS it's great, on Android it's pretty lousy. Uh, but even though it's great in iOS, it's still something is amiss. I get to know what the time is, 
but it doesn't tell me anything about like how confident it is about the time, right? I mean, it basically just reports a time, but it could be at that time it hadn't been able to synchronize with an NTP server for a while and therefore it is less confident, maybe the drift is more, none of those things are known. So uh, it would be good if you had direct control over it. Now either they have to change those APIs or you can implement the NTP client locally within the application. So there are libraries that let you do that. So if you are creating an application which has precise timing need, you might want to use one of those libraries and then directly give the time. Yeah. So given the time that have somewhat of a sort of planning filter in It does. Some, so would it then have a consent so that you have to put the document there? It does, right? Uh, so deep down it does, right? The thing is that if you are running on the native OS, like Linux, you do have visibility into those, okay, with appropriate thing. The problem is that neither Android nor iOS, these kind of systems, expose any of those APIs. So you really have no way to get access to that. But you're absolutely right that that confidence information is there in the NTP client, absolutely. And so normally what the NTP client does is it runs in a privileged mode because when it finds how much the time is off, then it has to tell the OS to correct the time, right? And uh, all correction means is that there is a transformation matrix uh, that gets updated. That counter is still running driven by your interrupts. All it is doing is saying to translate the counter to the value, you apply this transformation. And that transformation is updated by the NTP client. So that's the sequence of things that happens. Uh, but in systems where you have access to it, um, like Linux, you can do it. But if you're running on top of Android, even though Android is in turn top of Linux, um, tough luck. You really can't control, and you have no visibility into that. Even um, back to Nat's point, so what Nat was saying was, you know, the NTP client knows all this uncertainty. The problem is the standard OS APIs don't expose that. Okay, so even on Linux, you have to kind of go out of your way to extract that information, but it's there. So if you know where, what to do, you can get it, but it's not made available in a nice, nice API. Okay, uh, so NTP evaluation, pros, readily available, industry standard, uh, achieves, I shouldn't say secure at this stage, because some recent papers have, the slide is like, four or five years old. Uh, uh, some papers in the past couple of years have shown uh, security holes in this. So NTP had some security mechanisms, like uh, they would boot out a server whose time was out changing in weird manners and all. But it turns out that there are certain critical things uh, in, in, in NTP which were not addressed properly. So in security conferences, there have been some papers which are kind of pointing those out. No, 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 no. When you call get time of day, all it is doing is getting time from the local, your local thing. NTP client is running separately in the background at some undetermined rate, and it's updating the transformation matrix. Yeah. So, uh, let's say I'm on a Linux system, and then my, uh, like, I'm giving a get time, and it's invalid, but I'm server on time. No, you don't specify any server. Get time of the day is basically saying, get time, you're just asking OS, what, what is your best notion of time? Over time. That's all it is doing. So uh, NTP, remember, there are billions of computers, right? I mean, so if every program which needed time were to result in a call to the NTP server, uh, the, 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 the whole so ecosystem will crash. Let's say you have a batch code, you import NTP, and then you import NTP at the time. And then that is specified by the I have never done an import NTP, so I is there such a thing? Okay, I don't know whether Python has an NTP client for it. It does? Yeah, so maybe it would, okay? So, but the thing is you got to be careful about it. I mean, if it turns out that your machine is bombarding time.ucla repeatedly, they'll kick you out, uh, okay? So, uh, uh, they'll kick off your machine, I mean, not you out, so. <laughs> Like what the time there is and 
No, 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 you never ask for the time. So you have to speak the NTP protocol, so that underlying message exchange. There is no such thing to go to Apple and ask uh, what what is the time. You are it, you are ex engaging in that message exchange. And then you are going to then say how far ahead, behind, drift, and all of your local clock is, and then you create those parameters of the correction model. So I'm not like getting a friendly Nope. Is, uh, any uh, the time is provided by your local OS, and all NTP client do is to exchange that. So I don't know what this Python package does. I'll take a look. But uh, there, there are websites that just like publish a time as well, like time.com. Sure. Absolutely. But that's not the same. That's that, that's like you have to wait for the for the delay of the. Internet. Well, I mean, what they are, yeah, yeah. So so firstly, um, yeah. So whether you use them as a web service or what not, remember, all they are doing is. They are basically wrapping some web server or web service around the operating system's local notion of time, which in turn could either be an NTP daemon working off a local GPS, or could be an NTP daemon which in turn is fetching, or an NTP client which is fetching time information from elsewhere, right? Um, so how are those websites different from the, like, the NTP apps that you're having to create? Because the NTP apps actually speak the actual NTP protocol to talk to an NTP server. They are not going to a computer and getting the time from there. They're actually engaging in the underlying NTP protocol with all that complicated uh, machinery, uh, doing it uh, multiple, let's see if I can. <sighs> okay, I'll have to let's see, I'm not familiar with it, so um, I'll have to. Let's see, maybe I can do it on my iPad, bigger screen, and then I can show you this, hopefully. Okay, so, little attempt, okay. So, this is an app on iOS, and what it is doing is, uh, uh, it is basically connecting to four time servers. It shows the offset it is getting with respect to each. So like it's showing 0.001 uh, on this one, zero on this one, zero on this one, point oh four. So it's basically seeing four millisecond offset relative to, okay. And then it is publishing a time, and then it is also showing how much confidence it has. So again, down to a millisecond and there are various other features in this. There is, uh, th this is much nicer than the versions available on Android, but the common thing out here is that they're actually running the NTP protocol, okay? They're not simply asking the OS what time it is. Remember, it's going to multiple um, uh, NTP servers, speaking that handshake protocol, and then developing a notion of time, and then it's reporting that, and since it has all that Kalman filter and stuff like that, so it's able to get its other information. So this this kind of uh, 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 application space is always an option. Uh, it's also an option when you don't trust the OS, right? I mean, uh, so like uh, if you are writing a uh, app on Android and given in light of information that I told you that the timing is very crappy and all, maybe you're better off kind of using one of those libraries to kind of do do uh, do things. So. Yeah, uh, so user space stuff is valuable, and since someone else has done the hard work, basically they probably took the code from the open source NTP client and kind of bundled it into something nice. But uh, that's that's a good option to have. Uh, uh, another sort of con of NTP is, or at least the, uh, is, since it's de it's designed for a space where for internet scale service with billions of devices. So it's not meant for frequent resynchronization. It is not uh, uh, flexible, so you can't just go around and very nearly sort of change things uh, in terms of sync rate and stuff like that. So what's really designed is 
that you run it in the background, forget it, it's going to maintain good time, okay? And the definition of good being in milliseconds or tens of milliseconds, okay? Uh, uh, since it is designed for that, so its convergence rate is also slow. So let's say you had a computer which was powered off and all, off the grid for a long while and you just power it up. It's not like suddenly it's going to get to very high accuracy because uh, it will take it some measurements before it can get an estimate of what its clock drift is. So when it starts out, it will immediately go talk to the NTP server, gets an estimate. But then the next time it will go is going to be hours later, days later potentially. So in between it's running open loop and it has some best guess estimate on what the local clock's drift is, but it's not correct. Mm -hmm. So it will learn the drift characteristics of its clock over time and only then kind of reach a uh, good thing. So, so basically, uh, it takes takes it a while to kind of get things down uh, the, um, down down to that level, and uh, it's also not energy friendly. It was not designed to be uh, for that purpose. So the protocol is kind of uh, complex, and I also like I also said, not secure. Uh, if you want to mess with NTP, if you are able to intercept packets in transit, NTP packets in transit, you can fool a computer's notion of time. And if you are using that computer to do things like, I don't know, unlock my front door at a certain time, all those kind of things and all, I mean, you can kind of, all, all the bad things that happen from bad notion of time can sort of come from there. Um, NTP, as this is again a slide I showed previously also, uh, it's really meant for good uh, characteristics over a long period of time, right? So that's the point I made earlier also. It takes time to convert. It does pretty good, but for short time thing, it's not going to give you a good uh, uh, good, good characteristics. Yeah. But um, it's really otherwise a terrific system. I mean, just think about it. Uh, your, any computer, any device, is, at least if it's on the internet, can easily achieve uh, sub 100 millisecond, maybe even close to a millisecond uh, in some, if your stars are aligned. Um, um, Apple, I mean, I was showing you one millisecond number, it's not just NTP, there's something else going on. Uh, you don't get uh, a millisecond just like that. And I was currently not even operating on Wi Fi, and, uh, it was just through the cellular link. So, I suspect maybe it is using GPS also, and maybe Android devices are not. I'm not sure. Um, again, um, those are kind of. Uh, and is it like that since there's battery drain, maybe it's hard to just keep up with Android on that? Sure, but that's because the app is continually displaying and all. Yeah. Right? I mean, so that alone, unfortunately, doesn't. And I can't run that app in the background. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. So. If you're yeah. running on airplane, yeah. Then Okay, so uh, why not just use NTP or GPS? I mean, I hopefully uh, the points I made, the answers are obvious. I mean, uh, energy related issues, they are not tunable. They're really designed for kind of some specific purpose and are like that. So if demands vary, if you have applications at different times which may have different needs, like think about NTP, right? I mean, so NTP is always running on your computer, always doing the same thing. But maybe at times you're running applications which are pretty leisurely, and then there are other times you're running applications which do need very precise timing. Maybe NTP can relax a little bit, okay, and sort of maintain poorer time when it is not needed and better time when it is actually warranted, okay? so you can have the quality of time kind of vary over um, uh, very longitudinally to do things. Uh, likewise, if you have a distributed system, maybe like I'm mean, at my home, uh, the multitude of uh, things in the network, do they all need time of that high quality? Likely not. Uh, some, a lot of them are doing some pretty mundane stuff, but yet NTP is totally agnostic to that, just, just uh, design. So, so, uh, yeah, so you're not, perhaps you want tunability and all. The other thing is NTP precision, like I said, it's like 
75 to 100 millisecond uh, kind of thing. And often, maybe even worse, but the big cause of the problem is, remember I said timestamp. Who is timestamping? Where is the timestamp happening? Now in NTP, the timestamp happens in the NTP client code, which is a process running on top of your operating system. And how are you timestamping it? Well, you're timestamping it by asking the operating system. So there is already delay there. And then when you timestamp, and then you send the packet, give the packet to the operating system to say, send it out. And then maybe the packet will sit on the queue in your ethernet or Wi-Fi card for a while before it goes out. So that actual timestamp of interest was when it went over the wire or went over the air. But the timestamp I'm doing is way up in the software stack. And likewise, when the packet is coming in, I would like it to be timestamped when the packet enters the system, right at that panting on, like the A to D converter when it's digitizing the signal. But what's happening here is it's being in the system from the old, I mean, they basically timestamp when the application, when the client gets the packet, so which is after the packet has traversed through the layers of the software. So a lot of that stuff adds to the uncertainty. So so NTP, uh, so could you take things down? Now, sort of, uh, uh, indeed, now we know how to create systems where we can get things synchronized to, uh, let's say, easily. On, I'm talking about Raspberry Pi and uh, these class of systems down to 0.1 microsecond, maybe even 10 nanosecond. Uh, if you are CERN and all and are willing to spend some money and calibration effort, they have shown point. Uh, like a picosecond, 0.1 picosecond. Um, so certainly one can do those kind of things, but uh, NTP was never meant for that really. Okay, so it's not tunable, it's not precise for a lot of things, um, and uh, and this kind of tends to be in a different way. Okay, so a lot of work in uh, sort of as wireless came into being and IoT, wireless sensor networks, and you know, a lot of work went into kind of essentially providing something beyond these. And likewise in the wired side, lots of applications emerged where precise timing was necessary. So I'm referring to here things like factory automation, teams of robots working on an assembly line and all, uh, you need a much tighter time synchronization. And that led to another standard called PTP, or Precision Time Protocol, which is kind of meant for that. So, so NTP has been overtaken in those spaces. Okay, it's still there for the wide area thing, but a wide area coarse grained. And then local area fine grained, you have a different set of things that can emerge. GPS, if we could, uh, is kind of orthogonal, if you could have low power, low cost GPS which works indoors, that would be terrific, but those things don't exist. Okay, so then let's see how uh, we can design uh, our own uh, synchronization method, and I kind of already gave you a peek ahead to that slide, but let's build up to it, okay? So our basic problem is that I have a network, and it's connecting a bunch of nodes with clocks. And uh, I want to synchronize these clocks, okay? And uh, uh, when we kind of do it, um, so remember the stack we had seen before, which is kind of, at some stage there is some sort of a counter which is sort of incrementing, and then the software reads that counter and then perhaps applies some transformation to it to tell you what time it is. Okay, what time, let's say on UTC it is. Um, there are certain parameters uh, that one would have, one should take into account, which is what your resolution is, what your precision is, and what your accuracy is. So resolution is when the counter is being incremented, um, uh, then how often it is being done, okay? Uh, the smallest increment at which the software can actually read it would be called precision, and how close is it to your designated coordinate system, the UTC, what the accuracy is. So now, this time synchronization problem is basically one of calibration. That is, what we want to say is that this convert time 
from my reference to the time being reported my local clock, namely the reading from that counter, I need to apply this function to it, okay, and the parameters of that function. So I will decide on some function. Let's say we say my only functions are going to be of the form A times local counter plus B. Then what are the values of A and B that convert my current reading into this? Now I'm giving a very simplified picture uh, because I've ignored the time dimension, right? I mean, you may also want to do something there. So nodes have imperfect local clocks, and we have previously talked about some of those. But one is we are starting, when we start out, the local counter will have some reading. And depending, up, let's say we always start it out at zero. But now depending upon when in UTC I started my computer, the zero of my local clock has a different value in UTC terms, right? So even if, like let's say you're bringing up a network of IoT devices, it's not as if you can boot all of them in synchrony, okay? Uh, and even if you do, they'll take different delays and all, right? So the zero t uh, whatever, local clock equal to zero means the mapping to UTC is unknown. So then we have drift, and drift, you can say, is basically uh, uh, the, 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 the rate at which the clock is advancing, how is that rate itself varying in time? So the rate at which the clock is advancing is what we call as frequency, right? But if you notice the omega of t, so it's because it's a function of time, because the clock is kind of drifting apart. We have seen these kind of plots previously also, that uh, if frequency was fixed, then the time would advance linearly, but you see kind of these things are drifting apart. Applications have very different needs, and this goes to the argument about tunability. So if you think about the kind of APIs that operating systems offer having to do with time, they kind of fall into a few distinctive categories, okay? Uh, what time it is, do something at a particular time, right? Those kind of things. What about in a network setting? What kind of things one might need? So I have given you some example. Like for example, I might say, map my local clock time to UTC or to a global time. Or I might say, map the global time to my local time. So like for example, if I want to say, uh, do something at 5 p.m. January 1st, 2020, UTC. Then I might want to know what counter value should I trigger it on, okay? What, what does it mean in terms of my local time, right? Um, uh, for example. Map from time at one node to another. So one sensor node sends me something saying it saw the dog at time t. Then I, and if you are not synchronized, then I might say, hey, what does it mean in terms of my clock, right? So fundamentally, synchronization is really doing these kind of transformations between coordinate systems. I have my local clocks coordinate and I have coordinates of time at other local clocks at other nodes, and then we have this global UTC, and it's moving back and forth between them. Now, one approach to this is global time sync, right, which is what NTP seeks to do, which basically says we are going to get all the clocks synchronized so that everyone's time coordinate system is notionally the same. But under the hood, that's not the case. All, all that NTP is doing is learning the transformations. So, Canonically, when we say time sync, um, there are really a couple of things which are happening. Um, one is that, so, so one, one way is that if I need to know what time it is on my clock uh, relative to some other node, then one way of doing it is I just make a measurement. I do that handshake that I showed previously, and then I get the offset, right? So that is what I have shown out here. I can simply measure the offset between i and j, uh, but it is a time varying offset. If I measure the offset between two devices now, in a second later, that offset will probably be different, partly because of measurement noise and partly because our clocks are drifting. So there are two, as two things which cause offsets to be a function of time, right? One is measurement noise, all those like time stamping errors and all these kind of things and the other is the clocks are drifting. How can you take care of measurement noise? What happens if you have a noisy sensor? What do you do? What does that mean? 
Like, can you filter a single reading? If I give you offset right now, you can't really, I mean, it is what it is, right? You have instead multiple You, what did you say? Multiple, multiple readings, right? Multiple readings and then you process them, right? So, so uh, and of course, if it is nice Gaussian noise, then it's terrific. If it's ill-behaved noise, then uh, you, have, you have trouble. Um, and the other thing is that it's moving, right? I'm trying to, I'm not trying to estimate a uh, fixed value, right? I mean, if I if I were if I had whatever mass of this bottle unchanging, let's say, okay, no evaporation happening, then you take multiple readings of it, and then you average them out and all, or do some other filtering, and you get the mass. But now imagine that uh, not on, I'm not simply there's a hole in the bottle, and the water is gradually leaking, and now I'm trying to estimate that m of t. It's a tracking problem, right? I mean, so so clocks are moving targets, the clock offset. So what? So 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 somehow uh, you need to kind of do that tracking, and then in between when you make these measurements, uh, so 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 one so one way you can approach it potentially is you could say, okay, I'm going to make a measurement and get the offset, and I'm going to assume that this offset remains constant until I measure it next. So. Uh, and if you measure frequently enough, maybe it's fine. Or the other way you can say is that, you know, I made this measurement and I also made prior measurements. And I'm going to fit a model to it. And then I'm going to use that to predict what the offset is if you ask me a little bit later. Instead of going and re-measuring, I mean, uh, I can make use of a model. So that's what the second bullet is saying, that I could uh, learn a model of the clock drift and then use that model to answer the question about what is the offset now, okay? Because uh, uh, my alternative was use the latest reading, for example. Perhaps another option could be when you ask me for the time, then kind of like what Akash was suggesting, I go and ask for the time at that time. I make a measurement on demand. But uh, both of those options are problematic because my single measurement is noisy anyway. And also, uh, if clocks are drifting, I can't simply reuse the latest measurement because the clocks, clocks may have drifted potentially even more during that period. So, so best way of thinking about clock synchronization is then tracking a physical process, the clock offset and drift, by repeated measurement and then learning a model and fitting that. Now, that model could be anything, right? I mean, um, everything that you are taught in machine learning courses and signal processing courses and all, you could have simple linear model and you can have a fancy neural network, right? I mean, but fundamentally, uh, it's, you're trying to model a physical process. That's Like you are saying, every millisecond you are going to resynchronize. No, let's say like um, if the whole thing, or the whole synchronization operation takes like one minute to perform, and then so do I ignore drift like for that one? Oh, so so you are asking a different question, and we'll see. In some cases, we can. In some cases, we can't. So there are two separate issues. One is my handshake takes some time, okay. and the other is how often am I doing that handshake, right? So equivalent of saying a measurement takes time, and what if the process is changing during that measurement. And the other is, how often should I do the measurement? I was focusing on the latter. And I was kind of mentally assuming thus far that the measurement is instantaneous. That is, uh, when I send the message and the other node sends a message back, the time gap is so tiny that we can assume that the clock didn't drift during that period. That's not always true. Um, I've been assuming out here that message exchange was very rapid. But in many cases, not. And one example where it is not even in wireless is when you are underwater, because then you don't use radio links. You use acoustic. And so then speed of sound. And so then the messages take a longer time. And then the clocks can indeed drift. And in those systems, not only do you worry about drift in between handshake, but also during a handshake. Yeah, so that's within the handshake, right? Yeah. So, 
during that time if you are so look whether 5 millisecond is good or bad depends on your clock right i mean what your oscillator is 5 millisecond is pretty lousy if you are using a on chip uh, ring oscillator for example on the other hand 5 millisecond is uh, yeah, pretty good if you are using a 1 ppm clock it won't drift much okay but if i want like Uh, if you want nano, well, you'll probably not get to nanosecond just with that, but 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 um, five millisecond is still too tiny to worry about it. Yeah, clock drift happens because of what? Temperature. Temperature changes at scales of seconds. Right. So you are your phenomenon, your your changes that are happening. So um, to a good order, uh, clock drift is fairly linear over seconds. Let's say order of ten seconds. Okay, so that looks fine. So, um, so basically, what happens in the synchronization process, then, in some senses, is that uh, under the hood, I have this clock, which is which started with some particular T naught, and which is moving with some particular time varying frequency. Uh, which I don't know because it's driven by temperature and other physical phenomena. Uh, and then I get a local clock, okay? And I'm kind of taking this continuously over here. And then the software, this is like an undisciplined clock, right? It's uncontrolled, it's just running. And the software um, then has to take this, and then we are going to um, uh, apply some transformation to it, which we have learned through the calibration process, through the synchronization process, and that is what we expose to application. So there's some mapping between this T of t to the UTC time or whatever time scale that we set, and that's that mapping is what you are seeking to learn. Now, very simplified view that systems use is the following, that we can say that time has an offset, which basically indicates the starting point, and that uh, there is a Q rate, alpha, which is a constant, okay? So if my, um, that is D clock over DT, there is kind of a frequency. So this is a software view of clock, right? So time is advancing at a certain frequency, and there was a certain starting offset. Uh, but this is a very simplified view as we kind of already uh, saw in the discussion. So the process of synchronization really boils down to learning these things. So there are few different things that get lumped under synchronization. Synchronization of frequency, that all I want to do is I want to make frequency at one node the same as frequency at another. Synchronization of time. I want to make the time at one node the same as the time at another node. And finally, synchronization of phase, where uh, frequency is the same and the phases are the same. But we may still not have any, you may think it's January 1st and I may think it's March 1st, okay? Uh, but, uh, but if you measure a passage of time, and if you were to ask that every second, whatever, do something, we'll do that in synchrony. But uh, not, uh, not must have a common name for time. So all these three things occur. Where do you think um, uh, synchronization of frequency is important? Frequency is synchronized, but phase and time are not. Can you think of some application where that would be useful? Okay, so, uh, well, okay, uh, not quite, but the duty cycling example I had last lecture, okay? Where I had said they're duty cycling at the same rate. So that's an example where frequencies that matter. Uh, if we also had phase aligned, then it would be better. If we also had time aligned, then I can do even other things, right? Uh, frequency alignment is often necessary in communication, okay? And uh, frequency and phase alignment uh, can let you create things like uh, bounce back a signal with no delays or sort of things. So there are um, interesting 
application for each one of these cases. So we are almost uh, we are, uh, yeah, yeah, at the end of the time. So uh, next time that I am going to describe uh, some of some of these strategies that how do we go around doing it. But it's basically a model learning problem. It's a calibration problem uh, that you're trying to solve. Okay. So some of you came in late. So um, this Friday we are going to have our uh, discussion section, and every group. Um, one person from the group has to present a short three slide presentation on what the project is uh, and like what, what the problem you're trying to solve, why is it important, those kind of things. I'll send some guidance in Piazza, but roughly that. And, and then uh, also what your current status and results are, any, any kind of, okay. So this is kind of combining, some, some of the projects got finalized relatively late. So, uh, this is kind of both a formal project proposal, but also kind of a midterm exam or whatever, midterm checkpoint uh, of where you are. No more than three slides, no title slide, just, um, just, uh, so if you have a title slide, that's extra. Okay, so three real slides, and uh, what I would do is I'll ask you to uh, submit it uh, uh, so that I can just have all, all of them preloaded onto my laptop. Great, so see you on Thursday. And again, there is a nice talk on embedded systems, 11 a.m. Thursday, faculty candidate. So check it out. Yeah, uh, for the Friday's discussion, it's not mandatory for everyone to attend because I have and Your partner can attend, that's fine. Yeah, I have a free uh, schedule. Sure, that's fine, but make sure your partner is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, Alexa. Hmm? Alexa? Yes. Is that it? Thank you. Okay. So send me an email that you are checking it out. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, it gets linked to your Amazon account, okay? So when you are done, make sure to deregister before returning because otherwise I won't be able to use it. Okay, so I deregistered it from mine. Um, uh, if you want high, so so the only difference between this Alexa and bigger Alexa is that its speaker is pretty low uh, quality. So if you want a higher quality sound, just plug some speaker to it, okay? Oh, but otherwise, from in terms of speaking to it, it's the same, mm -hmm. okay? So I forgot, uh, you told me that one of the students had the uh, motion sensor for the door. Oh, yeah, Renju Leo. Okay. Okay.